We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm glad we have as much time on the clock this morning as we do. We have a lot of scripture we're going to be looking at. <coughs> so I hope you have nimble fingers today or your Bible app is ready uh, because we're going to be looking at a lot of passages. Looking at the weapons of our warfare, I think this is our fourth message as a, an offshoot of the study of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and actually it's verse 4. But let's do this this morning. Let's read out loud 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, reading out loud together. If you would join me, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... <clears throat> who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I don't think this completes the thought, the thought you have in verse 4, a parenthetical. It actually, I think, completes the thought in verse 6. But we actually have some territory to go to in verse 5, which we're going to be exploring in depth. And then culminating in verse 6 as a segment of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, a thought that Paul's going to. In short, his target is obedience, and that's a, a great message we're looking forward to as we get there. Uh, but we are on the fourth of this subset of the weapons of our warfare. For that, uh, I've given a list of the weapons of our warfare, and in that we gave one, or I gave one. There are eight in total. There is one I gave that is not in Ephesians chapter 6, but you can go to Ephesians chapter 6 because we're going to anchor off of that passage looking at the weapons of our warfare. The one I did not give in that list is preaching, and that was found in 1 Corinthians one twenty one, where we read, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, and pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 6. We'll pick up with these weapons of our warfare and get us up to speed with number six, number six, the helmet of salvation. So preaching is one of the things that God uses to, as it were, be about the spiritual warfare that God has called us to. We re reference in Ephesians chapter six, other weapons that God gives or other uh, armor that we're to wear. And it's in verse 14 that we read, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We've walked through this. We've walked through truth. Uh, in verse 14, in righteousness in verse 14. Verse 15, the gospel of peace in verse 16, the shield of faith. And then in verse 17, we pick up then with the helmet of salvation. Each one of these are given, so as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, they're given for how we as Christians navigate a difficult life or a troubled life. Uh, a life where there are going to be problems that come your way, but really also so that as a believer, you would know how to stand in the promises of God. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 that these weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So they're not just mighty through God so that you can embrace them and so that you can stand but they're actually the weapons of spiritual warfare that God uses to pull down strongholds that would not be able to come down with the strength of man. It is God who's able to, to penetrate and break through those strongholds. And those strongholds are individual. They're, they're the one that would say, you know, there's somebody in my life that I know that, you know, they're so hard against God that they would never come to Christ. 
God is able to break through to that. God is able to break through to that life. By the way, just as a subset, you know, this isn't, I only minister to this because I've had people come to our church um, with some damage along these lines. There are people who, in the vein of election, will say, you know, there's a person that you know that's not walking with God, or they're so, they're so wicked, they must not be one of the elect. And then there's this idea that they couldn't be saved even if they wanted to. And I'm just going to say that that is not consistent with what I see the Scriptures teaching. Anybody that wants to come to Christ can be saved. And there's nobody so far gone that God can't reach them. After all, God reached you. So God is mighty through the pulling down of strongholds, and you need to know that and believe that. You need to thank the Lord for those in your life who are standing in resistance against God so that they know where the line is. They know, and they are fighting against the Lord. In that circumstance, God is able to penetrate through to that heart. You can have confidence that God is able to the to pulling down of those strongholds. Now, when we think about our country and think about all that goes on in our country in politics and in the world, uh, I don't know why, but I watched a depressing commentary about the state of affairs in one of our neighboring states and how things are uh, declining and going so badly. You look at those things and what do you find? The hope of the world is Jesus. And if we would do what God says, if we would come to him and follow him, the Lord is the one that brings peace. The Lord is the one who makes things right. The Lord is the one who breaks through and is able to pull down strongholds. You need to know that. And I just want to say testimonially in my own life, there are things that I've experienced where I would have, <laughs> if I would have ever seen them coming, I would have thought those things would be too hard for me. And there's a way in which you can say that they are but they're not too hard for God. God is able. So what we're really getting to, believer, is you don't need to be afraid navigating through life with what's going to happen to you. God is big enough to take care of you. He's big enough to pull down strongholds. And when God doesn't pull down the strongholds that you want to want pulled down, God is still able to be trusted to work with you in that circumstance to bring his name glory. God is is able. We come to this point. It is number six. It's not number six in the whole list that we've get, uh, that you find in Ephesians six, but it's number six in verse seventeen. It's the helmet of salvation. Here we read in Ephesians six and verse seventeen, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I, I, before I get into this, I want to tell you. We went over verse 15, uh, da, 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 the, the faith. We went over faith very quickly. Um, Gospel of peace. Yeah, verse 16, the shield of faith. Uh, I have to tell you that I wish we would have spent a lot more time on that. <laughs> Each one of these, even in this little verse in verse 17, has two aspects of our warfare and they're worthy of your consideration. So we have a lot of scripture that's going to back up these two points. The helmet of salvation. Well, why is it that we need to take the helmet of salvation? And what is the symbolism of the helmet? Well, I would invite you to study this out yourself and to explore it devotionally. But a helmet in battle protects the center of the decision-making process. A helmet protects where the decisions are made. If the head isn't protected, all the other armor becomes of little use. So if your head isn't protected, all the other armor isn't that significant. It doesn't mean it doesn't help you. It just means that the head has to be protected. Nobody goes into a battle where there are bullets flying or armor fly, or arrows flying without putting on the helmet. It is a standard piece of equipment, and its number one role is to protect that decision-making process. There's a lot to be said in this. Now, you've heard this euphemism before. What happens if you lose your head? When someone is said to have lost their head, what are we saying? 
What does that mean in someone's life where they have lost their head? I follow that up with, well, I'm, I'm not talking about the literal uh, guillotine, okay? I'm talking about when someone has said euphemistically to have lost their head, there's a word that's associated with that. The word that I think of is panic. Another word might be fear. So let me ask you, uh, is fear debilitating in battle? So if you are in a foxhole with someone and you're in battle and they are gripped by fear, what does that often look like? Well, it looks like someone caves in on themselves and they are frozen, literally in place. And what's happening while they're frozen there? The battle is still raging on. You might as well say that they are of no use in the battle because they are out of the fight. Because they're frozen in place. Now, just as a moment here though, if we think about losing your head or not protecting your head in that decision-making process, if that is not protected, we use the word panic, is this what God has for you as a believer? Is, does God want you to live in the state of panic, in the state of worry? Here, I can, you know, I am a prophet. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. We're going to have a, a presidential election coming up. And when that happens, there is going to be a much, much ado about if this person is elected or if this person is elected. If this person is elected, the world will come to an end. If this person is elected, the world will come to an end. <laughs> and so you're going to have a lot of panic over what happens to this person, what happens to this person. And I know when you say these things and I'm just going to tell you now, this is not, not that church where you're going to find a lot of political banter about, uh, you know, just what's going on in the world of politics. We should be engaged, but as we said last week, we are not called to live in fear over who's elected and who's not. Should we be engaged? Yes. But our hope is in Christ, and God does not want you living in the spirit of fear. Now, just, I'm going to take you there really quickly. I'm not going to give time for you to get there, but it's 2 Timothy 1.7, and it's just simply that verse. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now, it doesn't stop there. He gives you something else. Not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. In other words, if you walk with God, he prevents you from being crazy. All the while, everybody else who isn't walking with God will look at you as if you are crazy because you're not panicking when the world seems to be falling apart. Why? You have the helmet of salvation. That helmet matters. What we've learned already is that the most important thing that you can know, and this is central to the helmet of salvation, the most important thing you can know is the gospel. From your head, you know and understand by the grace of God what salvation is. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 if you're in 2 Timothy, you're not far from 1 Thessalonians. One of the blessings of the helmet of salvation, as we're going to look through, is what the helmet does for us. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8 expands upon this weapon of warfare, this defense mechanism of warfare, this helmet of salvation. It gives us a reason that the helmet is so important when you're going into the battle. You have 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8 there. Would you read it out loud, loud with me? But let us who are of the day be sober, 
putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So we're going to come back to that thought in just a moment, okay? So the helmet of salvation as a weapon of warfare, this not carnal weaponry, but this spiritual weapon, the helmet does several things for us. When you have the helmet of salvation on, that helmet of salvation centers again your decision-making process. And when you have yourself anchored in the gospel, you know, number one, who your captain is. You know who you are following. And we are living in a proverbial world right now where people don't have an anchor for truth And so truth is what the next popular idea comes out as, or the next next person in authority who has the ability to make that decision says, hey, here's a thought, let's do this. And you have one man and one person doing what is right in their own mind. And it looks like chaos. But you know who your captain is. You know not only who your captain is in your salvation, but you know what he wants you to do. When you know who your captain is, you know what he wants you to do. You know your marching orders. You know the plan. So let me ask you, as a believer, do you know the plan? Hello? You're quiet this morning. Have you been camping? Do you know the plan? What are one of the concepts of the plan? What's the plan? Well, there's lots of different verses you can anchor on. Whether therefore, you, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, what? Do all to the glory of God. Whatsoever you do, do heartily as to the Lord, not unto man. If you know the marching orders... And you know what God wants you to do. You know what the plan is. It also means then that you know that there is a plan. That plan has an end. Is there an end of the battle someday? There is. So the Bible tells us that we're in a battle. That battle is raging on. The Bible tells us that in the time in which we live, that times will wax worse and worse. But there is a day when that battle will be done. We know the captain... We know what he wants us to do. And most significantly in that plan, for you as a soldier, for you as a follower of Jesus, you know what the target is. Another way of saying that is, you know where you are going. And what a lot of people in this world are doing, they're trying to find that magic happiness in a world that has fallen. I talked to a person this uh, last week, and, and they, you know, they, they said they were raised Catholic, and now they're Buddhist. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and I listened to them explain, listened to them explain what that meant for them. And their thought that is, there's this, there's this hope without an anchor that we're all going to get to heaven. And we're all following maybe a different path, but we're all going to wind up there. And I'm just saying that that, you you know what they, they do? You know what propaganda is, right? So in battles, there are often propaganda drops where you'll have flyovers. And uh, in all kinds of battles, this has been the case. Uh, Sometimes with loudspeakers over the enemy lines, telling people lies so that they will believe the lie. Well, the anchor of the helmet of your salvation is that you know that there is a captain, you know what side is right, and you know what that captain offers because he's provided the way through his death, burial, and resurrection, and he's promised to you everlasting life, which means you know where you're going. And knowing where we're going affects how we navigate the battle today. Had a conversation with somebody just yesterday about 
why we do what we do and the decisions we make and what jobs we have and, and how that lays out. And I'm going to tell you this, you can pick any job on the planet and if, if you live for a job and live for an income and live for a thing, you're going to come to the end of your days and what are you going to find? It was ecclesiastical. It is vanity. Our lives have to be centered as believers in Christ and about him. This is the helmet of our salvation. And God wants you to be anchored in the fact of knowing who he is as your captain, what his plans are for your life, but ultimately the end of the battle where you are going. God wants you to know that. And if you know Christ, you have his promise for where you will be. Knowing your salvation in Christ gives you the direction and security you need no matter where or what your battle is. How many of you have had some bad thing happen to you? Okay. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard believers say, and this is the right statement, I don't know how people do this without the Lord. But I can tell you how many people do it with a gnawing, aching void in their lives that are often sought or seeking to be filled with something that cannot fill it. Sometimes it's a relationship, sometimes it's a person, sometimes it's drugs, trying to find something to fill that awful, aching void. And that void is a broken relationship with God, which Christ came to heal. But God wants you as a soldier to know where you stand and whose army you're in. And when you know that, it gives you what 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 said, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a an helmet, the hope of salvation. Aren't you glad that there is coming a day? There will be a time in our lives where we, this is impossible for us to, to reference in this physical frame. That there is coming a day where we will not feel the stain of sin any longer. That day's coming. But for many believers, we're distracted by the, the arrows that are flying, the bombs that are going off, and we can often be gripped in that panic, not anchoring in who we are in Christ, and be brought to a place of fear. But God takes special effort to communicate your position in Christ. When you know him as your Savior, is there anything that can take you away from him? Is there anything, if you know Christ, that can break that relationship that you have with him? Well, according to the scriptures, no. But many believers have an anchored in Christ and they keep looking at their behavior and, and the world around them and they get distracted and gripped in fear. And God wants you to come back to the knowledge of the promises that he has for you. And to keep that helmet of salvation and put it on that you might live with the direction of hope in your life. So let's look at some of these passages that are famous to the life of the believer. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. To whom do we belong as Christians? Those that have placed their faith in Jesus. You belong to Christ, the captain of your souls. And in Romans chapter 8, we're going to read in verses 31 and following what God gives as a list, a question. What can separate you from the love of God? Well, in verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, it's rhetorical. Who can be against us? If God is for you, who can be against you? No one significant. No one worth mentioning. Because you know Christ, he that spared not his own son. This is what God the Father did for you so that you could have the helmet of salvation. 
He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Amen? It is God that declares that sentence of being justified when someone places their faith in Jesus. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake... We are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. If you read verse 36 by itself without the understanding of what God has promised in life and everlasting life to the believer, you would look at verse 36 and think we are simply sheep for the slaughter. That doesn't sound victorious, does it? And the truth is, As sheep, we have no ability to save ourselves, no strength within ourselves. Every ounce of hope we have is in Jesus. Verse 37, nay, in all these things, we are not just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. How? Through him that loved us. The word persuaded in the next verse means I am convinced of this fact. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in who? Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you want the helmet of salvation, if you want the hope that God has to offer, you have to come through Christ. But as a believer, when your life starts to get overwhelmed with the fear of the bombs going off and the the pain that's happening around you, you've got to come back to put on the helmet of your salvation and the hope that God gives through that salvation. Now, Does God want you to be secure in that? How secure does he want you to be? He wants you to know your position in Christ and has taken pains to make sure to communicate it to you that nothing can separate you from his love. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. 1 John 5, 11 through 13, and then John 10, and then John 14. Listen, I'm talking to this lady who's a Buddhist And she says, you know, I don't know how it's going to happen. I just hope somehow we'll all end up in heaven. You don't have that kind of a hope. You have a hope based on the resurrected Jesus Christ. We don't have a hope that the world has that fades away and has no strength in it. We have the hope that we have based on Jesus Christ. Well, where are you in Christ if you know him? This is the record in verse 11 that God has given to us what? So if something was to take your life in the battle, where do you go? You go to be with Christ. There is nothing that can separate you from that everlasting life that God promises to all his children and he wants you to know it. So number one, if you're not saved, you've got to repent and come to Jesus. You've got to forsake everything else you were trusting in and come to the place of the helmet of salvation and place your faith in Christ. But believer, that helmet still matters to you. It wasn't just a one-time decision when I was 15. I still wear the helmet of salvation and receive the comfort and help and hope that it offers because it is tied to Christ. He says that he has given to all who know him eternal life, and this life is found where? In his son. Declaring it in verse 12, in the, in the, in the very succinct, here it is. He that hath the son has what? He that has not the son of God 
has what? Not life. Did God leave that as a mystery? No. He made it so you can know it, so I can know it, so our neighbor can know it, so the world can know it. You, however, are the recipient of the benefit of this knowledge that God says, if you've got Christ, it's not that you're going to get life, it's going to be apprehended someday, but you have it right now. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Believer, does this give you comfort? Does it help you to know? Does it help you to to have an endurance in the battle knowing that there is coming a day where we will see Christ? John 10 John 10, verse 27 and 28. John 14, verses 1 through 3. What do you have to fear in the battle? What do you have to be afraid of? Do you need to be stuck in the foxhole, gripped by fear? John 10, 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall what? They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I've heard so many believers, listen to this. Are you with me? I hope you're with me in hearing this. There are so many believers that worry over, did I lose my salvation? Let's, let's get back to the anchor of our salvation. The anchor of our salvation is not our good behavior. If it was anchored on our good behavior, there's not a one of us would be going to heaven. And all you got to do is ask somebody that knows you. It's kind of like going to camp. One of the things about going to camp is you see people like you never see them before. (laughs) You also find out, I'm going to tell you, It's not just that some people aren't mourning people. It's that some people are angry that there's a mourning. (laughs) I don't know where I was going with that, but there it is. It's not based, our salvation isn't based on your behavior. We are all sin-stained sinners. You can't fool yourself on, well, I haven't been that bad and I haven't been this, that, or I haven't done that. You know, there is no one right before God outside of Jesus. Nobody. But when you know him, nothing can pluck you out of his hand. Now, I've heard believers say, but what, what, if I, what if I took myself out of his hand? Now, let, let's, let's take a second on that. Do you want to take yourself out of Christ's hand? If not, why are you asking the question? We play this game with God's authority and God's power. I would submit to you, that a believer does not want to take themselves out of God's hand. But God says that nobody can take you out of his hand. Nobody. John 14. You have this shell-shocked world, the bombs going off and the airplanes flying over with... Maybe you've got those visions of World War II and the the airplanes coming in and the machine guns are going off on the ground and and you're hunkered down and are you going to survive or not? Let not your heart be troubled. I'm going to ask it this way. Do you believe in God? Do you know him? He says here, ye believe in God, believe also in me, Christ says. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to do what? Prepare 
a place. Now listen to those two words, for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Listen to this, that where I am, there ye may be also. Does God want you to be with him? So in this room, you might say, well, I'm not saved. I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure if God could save me. You have here in the authority of Scripture that he is willing to receive you if you will come to him. And if you will come to him, he has got a home for you already in heaven. So he says, come. But believer, for us then, this helmet of salvation tells us that I've got a home in front of me and that all the struggles of this life someday are going to be over. Now, on your head, you have this helmet of salvation. Just a verse or so ago, we had on your feet, you have the gospel of peace. So what you had have is from head to foot, the believer is surrounded by the gospel of salvation. It's the helmet that gives us hope. It's the gospel of peace that's on our feet that gives us a standing ground. And without those things, as a soldier of Christ, you are lost and marching to your own drum. And by the way, there are believers that do that in rebellion. And you know what? You never find good there. You want to get right with God, he welcomes you to come back to him. If you want to know him as your savior, he welcomes you to come. For he is the one that gives you hope in the battle. You are going to face hard things in life. If you face, if, if you faint in the day of, of adversity, what does the Bible say? Your strength is small. But God did not make you to have small strength. God made you to have the almighty power of God, the weapons of warfare that are able to bring down strongholds. And some of you are living in, in, in some kind of a stronghold mentality that denies the doctrine of the word of God. I've got a husband or I've got a wife that, that I, I, I have never seen hope that this could ever change. And, and every time I talk to a couple that loses hope, I can tell you flat out that your eyes are not on Jesus because Jesus gives hope. And so we start believing things that aren't true that God can't break through. So you've got some you know, things going on in your life physically and, and it looks dark to you, I'm telling you, God gives hope. Even through the midst of what we hear from doctors as death knell sentences. Now, I don't, I don't want to be disrespectful of, of this, okay? But I'm, I can share this from many believers who've gone before me and had this very testimony. So what if you get a, a diagnosis that's going to take your life? Where are you going? I got, I got a different question for you. Do you want to live on this planet forever? I think for some seniors, in the labor pain of life, if I can call it that, I think some seniors would say it this way, I've seen enough. I've seen enough. Been there, done that, know what that's like, and I choose the hope that Christ offers. But that's what the helmet of salvation does. Now, I hesitate to go into these next two, but I'm going to, because I feel like these are standalone messages. But next one, number seven, is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So going back to Ephesians 6, we read in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So let me do this before we get into this one. Christian, God doesn't want you frozen in the foxhole. God wants you standing and moving forward in the calling of God in your life. Serve God with the time you've got. It isn't long. 
And we know that because of the hope of salvation. But how else do you navigate this world as taking on the armor? Take the helmet of salvation, you take it, you put it on, and you take the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Now, I want to encourage you, believers, if you're going to find hope, you're going to find hope in the Word of God. If you don't want to know right from wrong in this world, you need the Word of God. If you want wisdom, you need the Word of God. If you want truth, you need the Word of God. And you and I not only need it to hear it, it's one of the blessings that I have as a preacher. I'm going to tell you what I enjoy as a preacher. I've got nothing to say if it isn't for the Word of God. But I stand in front of you this morning giving you the authoritative word of God that will change your life. It'll change your eternity. And it'll change the way you navigate life. It will give you hope if you anchor on the truth of God's word. But there are believers that have their foot in the world, a foot in the Lord, and you're still waffling on what you really are living your life for. And the answer is God's word every time. If you and I will surrender, and this is really important to know, that there are many people gathered today in worship, and there's a whole lot of song singing about how we love Jesus with a life that doesn't do it. And God doesn't want us to be simply hearers of the word, but what? Doers. This starts navigating to where 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is going, our obedience. The word of God has been given to us so that we will know the plan that God has for our lives. But Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13 talks about the power of the word of God. Listen to this, folks. The word of God. You read it out loud with me. Verses 12 and 13, Hebrews 4. Read it out loud with me. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Is there anything that God doesn't know about you? Is there any area of your life to which God does not speak? I'm going to tell you, folks, that I'm, one of the things that we do often as a family, if I don't have something that I know to do uh, where we're reading our Bibles, we go to the day, the date, what's today, the 13th, and we go to Proverbs. And, we just, and we've been reading Proverbs for years. And here's the truth. Wisdom is lying on the ground and everyone in this room can be wise if we will listen to God's word. But you got to go pick it up. You've got to want it. And you've got to actually believe what God says. And here's, what, here's where it is. Nobody can believe for you, but we can predict how that's going to turn out if you're obedient to him or disobedient to him. The Bible's really clear where wisdom is found. And it is found in the word of God. The word of God is sharp. It is powerful. It is able to break through. So I'm going to tell you something that I, I, I hope to start for us. I don't know how long it's going to take me to get in this journey, but I've been burdened. It happened on the mission trip uh, over trying to find good gospel tracks. Now, by the way, there are good gospel tracks, but I, I really have been burdened lately to start a different methodology in tracks. And what I want to start doing with tracks is I want to start getting a couple verses, maybe it's on a three by five, professionally done, where you simply give two or three verses of the word of God, something along the lines of, do you know what grace is? And quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Do you know what faith is? Quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9. 8, 8, 9. And on the back of it, say, if you've got questions, call this number. Why? Because I believe the word of God is powerful. I believe that if we will just simply put the word of God out there, that God will use his word to break through people's hearts, 
to break through their reasoning, to break through and to bring down all the reasons and manifestations of, lo of logic and thought that are raised up against, well, I can't believe God because of this, because of this, because of this. Let the word of God do its work. The word of God is able to break through all of that. And I'm going to tell you that you need the word of God to save you from yourself. You need the word of God to navigate. You guys know what it's like. I, I don't know anybody has this anymore. Uh, maybe you still do. I, when I, tr in my travel with uh, using Google Maps and things, you put that on your phone and it's getting you from here to there. Am I doing that? Okay. I don't, I don't have my volume turned up on that, so I don't know if it still does it. Anybody remember those GPS units where you would miss your turn and it would say in a, a lady's voice, typically, turn around. And then if you wanted to change it, you could change the voice. Say, that was an upgrade later. You could even give it an accent, turn around, make a U-turn or whatever. The Word of God is a faithful navigator for your life. The Word of God will tell you right from wrong. The Word of God will lead you to salvation. The Word of God will be an anchor for truth in your life. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 are verses that we come to often anchoring in the authority of Scripture. And here's what it says. And that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures. By the way, you want your kids to be saved. You want your kids to know Christ. Teach them gospel from their earliest days. Teach them the the word of God from their earliest days. Keep them pointed toward the scriptures. From a child that's known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to do what? Give you wisdom, make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is found in one person who? Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? The word here is perfect. It means brought to maturity, truly furnished, completely equipped unto what? All good works. In other words, if you want to know how to navigate life, you don't need somebody's book for 1999. You need the Word of God. And the Word of God will lead you to salvation. I remember Pastor Chris telling me that this is how his dad got saved. He's one of those little bit more unusual circumstances where nobody gave him the gospel. He was at work working in a factory, and I think somebody gave him a New Testament. He started reading the Bible, and he came to Christ reading the Scriptures. This is what God does. While we were at camp, Derek gave a message on Tuesday night about the Word of God. And I was reminded of these two verses in Psalm 119. So you can turn there if you like, but I'm just going to give them to you. Psalm 119, 9 through 11, it says, wherewithal, how are you going to clean up your way? And by the way, this is, this is for anyone who's ravaged with sin and continual besetting sin. How are you going to get your life cleaned up? How are you going to find the truth? You've got to know Jesus and you've got to make decisions based on the Word of God. How's a man going to cleanse his way, it says in verse 9 of Psalm 119. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto the word of God. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Verse 10 says, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy what? Thy commandments, the word of God. Verse 11, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not what? That I might not sin against thee. Take your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel, the teaching, the doctrine, the leading of the who? The ungodly. Nor standeth in the counsel of the same, nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The scornful are those that are saying, has God said? The Bible doesn't say I can't do this. I can do what I want. And the truth is, you can do what you want. But all things, while uh, are not unlawful, all things aren't expedient either. All things are not helpful. And you've heard the phrase, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should so what protects you from error? You know, I got a young lady getting ready to go, go to college. I wish she was going to be staying in our house. At, you know, it was Carly, I wish she could just stay with us forever. 
But I'm not good enough for that young lady's life. She needs God to guide her. I'm not good enough for any of my kids to protect them all their life long. Only God can do that. And they have to have their own walk with God. You have to have your own walk with God. And you will either stand obediently and worship on his word or you won't. But the outcome is not mysterious. The outcome is not rocket science. I've been a pastor a long time. I've been preaching, I've been preaching messages like this for a long time. And I've seen a lot of pictures of our church as it's gone through the years, both when I was a youth pastor and today. And I can tell you, I can go back to those pictures. I can remember preaching messages to teenagers and teenagers and young people and young people and telling them, you've got to make a decision of what you're going to live for. And it's going to show up in about 10 years who God is really in your life. There's been young person after young person after young person that's fallen away from God. Why? Is it because God's word is not effective? No, it's because believers don't believe it and don't live by its authority. But you're not going to be magic in this world where you're going to deny the word of God and find that go well. You will not. Everyone in this room needs the authority of God's word. And he says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in that counsel. But verse 2, who, look who is blessed. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, when that person anchors their life in the word of God, what happens? Listen to what happens as you read further in Psalm 1. Verse 3, and he shall be like a what? A tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. In God's grace and kindness, he goes further and says, the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Consequence of that choice of not living by the authority of God's word, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way, what does it say? The way of the ungodly is God's word true or not? Do you believe it or not? Then how about we obey it? It is the armor that we have to take up. And, and as I look across this room and the eyeballs and the faces I see, nobody can make the decisions for you on this. You have to make it yourself. So I have responsibilities as a dad. This is what I want for my family. As for me and my house, God help me. As for me and my house, we want to stand for the Lord. Now, we're sinners. The Estes family is going to mess up. We're no better than anybody else on this planet. We need God just like you do. We need the word of God just like you do. And you can't obey God for me. And I can't obey God for you. But here's the truth of God's word. It is the weapon of warfare that God says, take up. Take up the word of God. Love it. Live it. Lean on it. It is your protection. I'm going to give this last warning. It's not just your protection from the enemy without. It is your protection from the enemy within. So in my heart's cry this morning, I need this message. This message, I'm going to tell you a little secret about preaching. Here's a little secret about preaching. Another reason I love preaching is because I need it too. I want it too. When I read these passages to you, they are medicinal to my soul. They are helpful to me. 
And really what you have is in this message, a message for me as well, Jeff, walk with God. Put on that helmet. Pick up that word of God, that sword of the spirit, and live by it, love it, embrace it, hold it. And as we're coming to it, obey it. It is yours to do or not.